Well, it's a very special edition of the Emissary Authors Podcast today. My name is Paul Edwards, and I'm joined, as usual, by my friend and my partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, how are you? I'm very well. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Lots of uh, wisdom here and excited about this idea of the holistic you, which is the book from uh, Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin. You you uh, know them, I understand, Paul. I've had the privilege of interviewing Rabbi Lappin in the past and uh, corresponding with him a little bit uh, over the years uh, to learn more. And it's really enriched my own uh, journey with the Bible. And so we are excited to welcome uh, America's rabbi, noted rabbinic scholar, popular international speaker, and best-selling author. And today we get two for one. We get Rabbi Daniel Lappin and the legendary Susan Lappin, <laughs> co-authors of The Holistic You on the Emissary Authors Podcast. Rabbi and Susan, welcome to the show. So good to have you. Thank you very much, Great Paul and Jason. Here. And uh, just a, a minor correction. I'm not sure it's as correct to say you're getting two for one as to say you're getting the whole one. The whole one. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh yeah, we got to dig into that one. I, well, I was just, I was excited uh, for this conversation because you co-authored a book and you served together uh, in in your work. And that, I think, couples very well with this idea of the holistic you in, in terms of of you know husband wife relationships i i i find it fascinating uh so maybe we could dig into that too so i love i love that you bring that out the whole one yeah that's good yeah no because if you interview only one of us you get half the story yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's true so rabbi you've written a couple of several best-selling books now and uh you've been on the national stage for quite a while uh, you have an enormous community that you've been building, the Happy Warriors, which I'm a proud part of. And, um, you know, you reach people every week with your podcast and you've written on business secrets from the Bible, thou shall prosper. So now along comes this message, which I'm very familiar with, but I don't know that the audience has a tremendous amount of familiarity with it. And our audience is authors. And so we'd like to speak a little bit on the context of integrating all of these five Fs as and when you choose to write a book. And I, and I just bet you have some wisdom and insight to offer on that. But I'd like to start with why this, why this message and why now? You know, our kids used to joke when people would ask them, what does your father do? They never had an answer. Mm -hmm. I would say, could, could you be an accountant or a lawyer, like a, a plumber, whatever? But what my father, I don't know what my father does. He does, it takes, do you have an hour? You know, I'll sit and explain it to you. And that's because we would be um, teaching or he would be teaching over the years. And sometimes it was finance book, a book like Thou Shall Prosper, which is how to increase your income. Other times it was marriage. Other times it was on building a community. It was all based on the Bible. And of course, the Bible is the picture of everything. So mm -hmm. all those things come together, but it's very hard to, to speak about them in 30-second sound bites. Yeah. And that's what this book is, is really. Um, it's based on the Hebrew word shalom, which people know as peace or hello or goodbye, is actually the same word as completion. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we are complex human beings and we don't just have one facet of our life. And so we need to put them all together and more importantly, to integrate them. And mm -hmm. that's really tough because it's very hard to put together um, being a good business professional and being a good spouse and being a good parent and being a good friend and being a good member of the community. I mean, you're out of hours by the time, you know, at this point, you, you run out, the day's over and you've only hit one or two of those. <laughs> Yeah. So that was really the idea behind the book is to work on how do we integrate those. And we were also very struck on, you know, the, the standard question, whether you're filling out forms for a real estate purchase or whether you're in casual conversation with people, uh, very often the question comes up of, you know, what is your net worth? And it's an important number. But we realized that people were confusing their real worth with their net worth. Mm, mm. And so if um, if somebody uh, successfully creates a very significant net worth, but in the process loses friends, loses family, 
is that considered a good life? Is that considered success? I don't think anybody would say yes, which reminds me of uh, this, this lady. Last week in Business Insider Newsletter, they profiled a woman, Gwen Mertz, and she's in her early 30s now, but she was following a program which the idea was put away as much money as you can so you can retire early. Yeah. And well, it's, fire. It's, fire. it's an acronym, it's, right? It's an acronym. Uh, um, financial independence retire, retire early. early. Yeah. And she did that. And it was, it, it just spoke so much to the holistic you because she spoke about along the way, she lost certain things such as pursuing romance because she found she was so focused on saving money that she wasn't able to deal with a person who didn't have exactly the same view that she did. Mm -hmm. And she spoke about living in a living space where she wasn't, she had literally no room to pursue her hobbies because she bought a place, but then rented out most of it to other people. So she wasn't able to do those things that we call faith, meaning that that fed her spirit, her soul. Most interestingly, she realized that she actually hurt her financial bottom line, mm. even though she saved something like two hundred thousand dollars in a few years. By the time she was twenty-seven, twenty-seven, she had two hundred thousand. She realized that because she wouldn't participate in networking activities with coworkers, mm. and then when it comes to a promotion, people turn to the people they know, and mm. she sort of had isolated herself so that even in terms of her job and her career and her professional life, she'd actually hindered her financial future a little bit by being yeah. so focused on just one aspect, saving. That was what she was focused on. And it was an, it was a fascinating interview. And then we noticed uh, some of the fascinating figures on the number of friends that men have. Mm-hmm. Now, this is, of course, not applicable to women because Even today, where there has been a significant deterioration, women still uh, have many more friends. And we actually have studies where uh, we ask guys, you know, please list the names of your friends. And and we say to them, you know, there's good news and bad news. The the good news is that it's not going to take you nearly as long as you think. And the the bad news is it's not going to take you nearly as long as you think. (laughs) Right. And um, and in 1960, guys would speak of having 30 plus friends. Mm-hmm. Once we clarified what it is, it's not relatives, it's not people you owe money to, it's it's people who'd come out to the airport to pick you up if you were stuck, you know. People will take your phone call or return it quickly. Uh, so back in the 60s, but that's 60 years ago, people had over 30 friends. As, as recently as 20, as uh, 1999, uh, people were still listing 14, 15 friends on average, men, not people, men. And now in 2020, well, 2022 are the latest figures that we've got, uh, men are listing four to five. Now, that's a very significant drop. Yeah. And we can obviously discuss reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that, um, and there are many. I want to stress this is an area. But one of the things that's happened is that uh, men are placing more and more needs upon their female partner, mm. and they're expecting her to be their best friend and uh, and all the friend they need. Well, it doesn't work that way. And so, uh, little by little, all this work began to to lead to an understanding of the five fundamental foundations of life: uh, family and friendship are two separate ones. Uh, I may have a wonderful spouse, but I still need friends. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of a, I heard the the old comedian Bill Cosby joke about that one time. He said, uh, your wife is not your friend, right? You could get a friend just by being a nice person, but a wife is special. It's a completely different category. Um, But, you know, what I was thinking about, as you said that, Rabbi, was, um, you know, Jason and I often tell uh, prospective authors that we work with, look, you really need to have a support system if you're going to get this project done. Because, right, uh, you know, Jason joked that I can show my book to my mom, and my mom is always going to love what I do. But she's not really going to give me an objective perspective that says, hey, you and know, you're a really limited need- number of copies she's going to buy. Right. <laughs> That's exactly. 
and you're, you're not going to get that perspective, right? That, that objective sure. view that says, Hey, this, this needs some work. You, you, you're really, um, lagging on communicating some of these ideas. So, but, um, there's Jason, you want to add that that for you? There are things I'd much rather hear from a friend than from my wife. And those are probably the things that Susan would much rather not be the one to have to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, just to touch on this idea of male friendship, there are certain ways that a guy can talk to a guy that he will never accept, it, you know, uh, it, from perhaps his wife. And if he uh, does, it would damage the marriage. It very well could. Absolutely. Now, I, you know, you talked about at, at the outset, hey, what is your, you know, what does your dad do? And it was sort of a complicated question. And how much we want, as I think, as people to see things in very simple terms, like he is an accountant. And that's like, okay, great. Suddenly I know all the battle accounting, you know. Um, when in fact, I think what you're uncovering with these is that there's, there, there's a lot of interconnectedness between the various roles that we play. And, and one sort of moves into the next, it's, it's like, i I think it's a pretty common theme nowadays to talk about, well, you know, that's just business. It's not personal. It's like, well, that's not true because we are holistic beings and we didn't just like take off our personal hat and then stick on our business hat and go, Hey, nothing touches me. What, what have you found when you're, when you were in your research about what people are struggling with? And how your five, your, 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 it was five F's, um, yeah. how your five F's help them make more sense of living uh, a, a full life. Yeah. Well, uh, the, 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 perhaps the, the most important aspect of the point of what you raise is that, um, people think what I need in life is balance, you know, so you'll, you'll hear stories. Uh, recently, we came across this, a very successful person, extremely successful. Um, he left a lot of money by his parents, um, married a lovely wife, and um, he uh, started talking to a therapist. And it was from the therapist we heard part of the story that um, he really has it in for his father. He really has it in for his dad. What's the problem? And he, you know, he went on and on and on with the therapist. Uh, he, he, what a bad person his dad was. Um, turns out his dad didn't come to his school soccer games. Now, soccer is not football. You know, in America, uh, soccer is um, it's just not of the same importance. And so um, we think, oh, that's really terrible. He didn't go to. His but look at what the man did for him, and then. We hear guys who are saying, well, I always leave work on time for my kids' uh, baseball game or what, little league game or whatever it is. Um, and then you wait and say, you know what? You, you live a very privileged and fortunate existence. If you can always put a silly children's game as a bigger priority than taking care of business, you've got an interesting kind of life. What would be far more valuable is to spend a little time with your kid and explain to him why there's a big difference between real life, running a business, and playing football or baseball in Little League. And I'm perfectly happy to, to pay for your school tuition and pay for you to get a bat or whatever else you need. And I'm delighted you're learning from good coaches how to play. But the idea that I have to be there to watch you, that's infantile on your part and my part. It's a silliness. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, part of it was sort of people think, well, I need balance. I've got to figure out, do I miss an important work meeting in order to be a kid? But we realize that's not nearly the whole story. The whole story is much more complex. And that is that it is not necessarily either or. What we want to do, uh, clarify and explain and lay out for people, is the way in which when I take care of friends, the friends dimension of my life, I also at the same time enhancing the finance and the, and, and the friendship. And when I take care of the friend, I'm enhancing the finance and the family and the fitness. And when I take care of uh, friends, when, when I take care of uh, health and, and fitness, that's also impacting my finances. Yeah. And when I take care of family, 
that impacts friend. And that was the key thing to understand. It's not that these are separate baskets in my life. These are not silos, but mm-hmm. they're a complex integrated system and, uh, and very similar in the sense to, um, uh, to, to a car where if I get really, you know, fantastic brakes and I install the best premium ceramic disc Brembo brakes and, um, and then I, I buy a, a superb W10 engine from BMW and I try and assemble what's going to be the best car in the world. And it doesn't work. It's not a good car at all. You know, a $30,000 Kia is going to be a superior car because I may have bought the best components, but they're not designed to work with one another. They're not an integrated system. Hmm. I like that analogy a lot. Uh, the, the analogy I've heard before is like pizza. So, uh, you know, what toppings do you want on your pizza and what proportions would you like those toppings in, you know, and there are certain ways of building a pizza. And if you don't build it right, if you don't put your crust on the bottom, that's all going to fall apart. It's not pizza, it's casserole. Yeah. But I think what you're drawing on that analogy of the car is much more powerful because that last statement there, there are certain things that are not designed to fit together. And no matter what tinkering you want to do, it's not going to work or it's not going to work well. And people are going to look at you and go, well, that doesn't work. And you'd be like, yeah, but I'm trying. I, I'm figuring it out. It's my thing's like, yeah, maybe not. So these, these pieces that fit together in your book, how do you, how do you address those various pieces and the decision-making process for what people, and I'm going on a limb here, but what people remove from their lives, what people add to their lives to create a system that works for them. Well, one of the things we did, the final part of the book is we have a column called Ask the Rabbi that we have been running for many years now, and we get questions from people. The final section of the book is actually, I I don't remember how many, but quite a a number of those questions to try to give exactly that, the practical guidance, where people are writing and saying, how do I do this? And, And depending on what it is, but as an example, we're not, you know, um, when we say family in the book, we, that family is very large. It's including your parents and your grandparents and siblings and nieces, nephews. And it also includes a spouse and children. I think in our life right now, that, I mean, it's shocking. The number of people who will now, t- first of all, are not married, are not planning on getting married at ages where people used to be married. But secondly, even if they are getting married, are saying, well, we don't, I don't want children. They're making decisions. I mean, it's kind of shocking. People are even having surgeries when they're 19 years old. That makes it impossible for them to have a child, which is a little odd to make that kind of life decision at such a young age. So I think we have very myopic views. And today we're very focused on today, right? Don't tell me about someone's life a hundred years ago. And I'm, and they did not live the way I think a person, they didn't think the way I think a person should think today. So let's get rid of that statue and that person is no good. And I don't have an eye on the future because I'm not going to have children. That's a very myopic way of living. And we're not saying, look, you've got to get married at 10 years old or you have to have children when you know it. But we are saying that as you, as certainly for an adult. And again, you know, we're not fans of the, well, I'm an adolescent at 43. We think you miss out on an awful lot of life when you think that, but it's happening. Everything's moving later. You know, we don't expect 18-year-olds to be mature today. We used to. I, yeah. What's happened? Biologically, has something changed? We don't do that. On June the 6th, 1945, 18-year-olds stormed the beaches of Normandy. And um, so we're not saying, you know what, you need to get married while you're in college and before you have a profession and, and at 18. But we are saying, have it in mind. Have an entire picture or picture of your life because you know what? How you behave when you're 18, if you're thinking, wow, in the future, I want a spouse, in the future, I want children, it changes what you might do at 18. You certainly don't have the idea of, well, I can get drunk every night because who cares? I'm young. Yeah. And you know that that's true for business now as well in a way that it didn't used to be because when that video of you surfaces, when you go for a job interview, all of a sudden... You should have had in mind that you actually wanted to be respected by your community. You wanted to yeah. be respected by your employer in future years. Yeah. So it's it's really a, largely a question of having 
having it all in mind, even though you obviously are going to focus on certain areas at different times in your life. Yeah. Even fitness, the truth is, does you know, a twenty-five year old doesn't is in good shape. You're, you know, if you haven't done something to put yourself in bad shape, most twenty-five year olds are in good shape. If you're aware of aging and you're aware, well, this isn't going to last forever, then you set certain things in place for the future, even though you may not have to focus on it right now. Yeah, yeah. I'd I'd say also that um, a good example of where faith comes in to these uh, five Fs. Um, is because automatically and intuitively, a majority of people would probably say that faith and finance are incompatible. After all, everybody knows it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel or whatever. I, I don't know the exact line, but uh, and um, well, you know, know. The, the love of money is the, is the root of all. Yeah, everybody knows those things. So uh, you kind of got to choose, you know, do you want to love God or do you want to love money? And uh it's it's going to be one or the other. So, um, the 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 general media from time to time I've noticed has a proclivity to uh, conflate uh, poverty with piety, mm, yeah. and they'll they'll often speak of disparagingly as religion of religious rednecks, you know, without two cents to rub together. And so when I find myself speaking to uh, many mainstream audiences and I, I speak about uh, uh, high net worth investment conferences that I've spoken at uh, entirely Bible believers, I get looks of utter incomprehension because the presumption is that faith and finance do not go together. Well, nothing could be further from the truth because one of the tendencies of secularism, and we can certainly, again, watch it in the progress of the United States of America over the last 60 years, and that is that secularism tends to contract a timeline for people. Mm. And so uh, what a lot of people are unaware of is that uh, when the Muslim armies were defeated at the gates of Vienna in 1683, that was on September the 11th. Yeah. And when the Ottoman fleet was defeated in 1571 in the Bay of Lepanto, that was October the 7th. Yeah. Uh, religious Muslims have long memories. Religious Christians have long memories, not in, a, in, a, in, not in the way of selecting dates for destructive actions, but a, a sort of awareness, you know, a, many of my Christian friends or intuitively think, well, you know, what would Jesus do? Mm. Well, why is, what's that relevant? I mean, it's 2,000 years. You know, it's very relevant because my timeline is expansive. I see the past and the future as well as the present. Um, uh, Jews, you know, Moses is as alive today mm. as, as, as he was 3,000 years ago. Mm. And uh, similarly, as far as the future is concerned, um, you know, I, I don't want to uh, trigger uh, politically sensitive people in the audience. So don't regard this as a proclamation of uh, anything. Rather, it's simply an interesting uh, demographic reality. And that is that um, uh, the, the whole idea of um, centering abortion as a litmus test for one of the political parties is basically an acknowledgement that the future is much less important than the present. Yeah. Now, in business, anybody who is successful in business knows that past and future are even more important than present. In fact, the way we explain it in the book is how the present is not a time, it's an action that converts mm -hmm. future to past. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. an instant of action that converts future to past. And so um, if, if you can't see a timeline that runs smoothly from 10 years ago to a year ago to today to 10 years' time, it's going to be very difficult for you to make accurate projections. What sort of products should you be doing in your research and development department? Um, what sort of uh, financial uh, set-asides should be put in place? And, and if you've got a good CFO and he's looking at it, 
again, if he's a person who has an understanding intuitively of past and future as well as of present, you've got a gem. You've got somebody who's worth more than somebody who only functions intuitively in the present. So uh, incorporating faith in terms of gaining a more comprehensive and precise understanding of what time really is, it's hard to think of anything more useful. No. I think where that connects with me is that one of the decisions that we've made at Emissary is to focus our efforts on working with faith-based authors. And not that the topic that they're dealing with and writing about has to be faith-based, but it provides a framework of definitions and language which, and I, and I want to say that, that faith is deeper than language, but, but when we make decisions, if we're operating with as faith, uh, uh as part of that decision-making process, sometimes we're going to come to different decisions and there's an incompatibility if we're using different languages, different definitions, and therefore, you know, the, the business, it's not going to working with that individual is not going to be as smooth. And it seems that the same principle is true as when people are dealing with the holistic you, your life, there are certain things that you have to deal with that are not compatible with one another. How do you walk people through this, these incompatibilities and uh, invite them to, uh, it sounds like, take responsibility for their futures? Well, faith is a, is a good example. Um, and I, here we have to confess to you that really the faith pillar should have been called the spiritual pillar. But the four F's and one S just didn't, <laughs> just didn't ring the right way. <laughs> just didn't work. And, and the reason we say that is because um, faith generally means some kind of relationship with God. And um, this book is uh, usable whether you fall into that category or whether you are a secular person. And what we're in, I'd say the sort of main section of what faith is all about is the spiritual. What is spiritual? Spiritual is not equivalent to religious or godly or pious. Spiritual, is, as Paul will have heard me say many times already, is nothing more than things that cannot be measured in a laboratory. Mm. And so loyalty, integrity, persistence, optimism, all these things that are really much more important than how much a person weighs. Uh, these are, if you're hiring somebody, what you primarily want to know are the spiritual things. And alas, we cannot measure them. If we had an instrument that could measure integrity, there's not an HR department in the world that wouldn't buy it from us at any price. No. And so um, spiritual factors are hugely important. And if uh, you know, you're in business, and we, we believe that almost everybody who doesn't hold a government job or is not a Supreme Court justice, is in business, then uh, one of the things you have to be aware of is how many of the decisions that people make about how to spend their money are made on spiritual, not physical bases. And I'll just give you one quick example out of a hundred I could give you, and, and that is clothing. The utilitarian purpose of clothing is really very simple. Keep you warm and uh, to, um, and, you know, and to, uh, well, I mean, that's protected, warm and protected if you're working in a, uh, you know, if you're walking through a thorny area, that's all that clothing is for. What about covering up your genitals? Well, that's not a physical need. Yeah. My pet chimpanzees really quite comfortable exposing himself in all kinds of disturbing ways. He's not bothered by it. And if yeah. we are nothing more than sophisticated chimpanzees, we should have no need whatsoever. Dignity? What's dignity? There's no, you can't measure dignity. Is that a physical? No, it's spiritual. The best clothing I own is my work overalls. I don't know if you know them. They cost me $14 at Walmart's. You step into the left leg, you step into the right leg, you sort of shrug back and get one arm through, and you shrug back and get the other arm through. Then you lean down and you grab a big fat brass zipper near your left knee, and you pull it up to your right shoulder, and in less time than it took me to describe the process, I'm fully dressed. 
<laughs> it's cheap, it's economical, it's practical, best clothing in the world. You're and not yet, wearing it. And I'm not wearing it. <laughs> And neither still haven't, still haven't seen that speaking engagement in your overalls yet, Rabbi. <laughs> we haven't, and yet I really should to make the point. And so just as one example, if you're in the clothing business, you really better know that people buy clothing for spiritual reasons, not for physical reasons. And that's when we speak about the faith section, uh, we are providing a vast 30,000-foot view of uh, the role of the spiritual in, in human life family life, right? In in so many different, and you know, and family life includes sex life. And there's so many ways in which that is a spiritual phenomenon as much as a physical one. Uh it, it in many ways it's it's a key part of the book because it it's so easy to see. It's much harder to see why you need family for successful finance. But mm. it shouldn't be hard to see why you need spiritual and faith understanding for successful finance. I think also, if I can say, you know, one of the, um, I think we asked one of the most um, the objectionable questions we ask is about, for example, men and women earning money. Hmm. And yeah, we that's, say, that's a good one. Yeah, right. You know, we're not saying the capability to earn money or the intelligence or the skill. We're saying, does earning money mean something different to a man and to a woman? And yeah. you asked about contradictions. Well, most couples we know at this time in, in the world are two-income families. It's to live a nice life, most people need more than one income. In addition, we both men and women have been told that professional satisfaction is a deep level of satisfaction. So I think people don't even think, do I need to earn a living? There's I obviously I want to have satisfaction and it and Society has sent the message that that comes through earning a living. Mm. But what we're asking is, does it mean something different to men, a man and woman? And where this comes into where it might interfere, for example, with marriage is, well, what happens when someone gets a promotion that necessitates moving to another state or another country? Does it make it, is it totally a... A checkbook amount. Is it a total, you know, well, if you will earn this much more or I will earn this much more, we go, we go for the bigger, more money. Or does it make a difference if that offer is to the man or to the woman? And it does. I mean, in real life, it does. In most marriages, there are something other than simply the dollar amount is what is at stake. Yeah. And so we explore that. And that is really a spiritual issue. What spiritually does earning a living and supporting a family mean to a man versus earning a living and supporting a family mean to a woman? Mm. I think that's I, pretty controversial. Oh, yeah, I, I can totally see that. I, I like what you're talking about, this elevation of, of the term spiritual and how we are spiritual beings and it is a part of of all of our decision making, whether we choose to think of it that way or not. Uh, and you know, for, for Christians, a lot of folks, I was just having a conversation the other day, you know, their, their spiritual life as they term it is I go to church on Sunday and then I go out to eat with some friends from church and then I go home and that's, that's it. Da 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 da. Did my spiritual thing, not understanding that a lot of our thought processes, like you, mm -hmm. like you talk about are spiritual in nature because we we are operating on a different uh we're we're operating in in making decisions by those the, by the things that are unseen no yeah. not the things that we see and the things that we see are simply following the decision making of the unseen now i you you've been married for how long i know do uh, you um <laughs> I, I know it's more than 30 years about right. 40, about 46 when all right dead. so you've got this i some of the things i'm surprised when you're having fun <laughs> so so some of the things that you're talking about i can't help but wonder uh if if time and experience and in your relationship if 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 it took that time to be able to write this book i'm wondering if you could unwind the clock and bring us back to a younger you a a, a less mature uh less full of knowledge when you're reading it when you wrote this book what 
p- p- walk us through the contrast of of you and how you came to this point of being able to write this book now, and how that would have been different had you written it. You know, and that's really interesting. I'll I'll take a crack at it, okay. and then you can. But look, I mean, I I will confess that uh, it turns out that uh, I was not as wise at thirty as I thought I was, but. Um, I must at the same time stress that, in my view, very little of this book is a consequence, very little of this book in substance is a consequence of our own life experiences. Um, It is mostly from these books behind me. Mm. It is mostly from ancient Jewish wisdom. Now, I would say, uh, I said in substance, so the, the actual fact that uh, your life uh, is on stands on five pillars. Well, that I, I knew when I was 30 because of the five books of Moses. And the fact that these are finance and family, and I knew that as well. And so did Susan. Um, the, uh, I think what perhaps, um, and, and it is a smaller part of the book, but but the style, the tone, um, I think even though Susan pointed out a rather awkward question we, we raised, and there are a number of awkward moments in the book where we have to express something that is very far from a massage with warm butter. It's, it's <laughs> uncomfortable, and, uh, and, and we do it. But, but you know that's why people are buying the book, to get the, the, the truth and the real information. Um, so I think I think we uh, probably uh, express it with just a little more understanding of our weaknesses and the weaknesses of our readers than we might have done uh, a few years back. But to answer your question, Jason, uh, substantively, uh, the book is not different from the book we would have written. Uh, many years ago. But I think it would have been more of an intellectual exercise years ago and the real life experience, um, our own and the number of people you meet along the way yeah, that's changes yes. it to that's fair. Yeah. something that you say, wow, God sure was smart. Was <laughs> sure. That's mm-hmm. right. Yes. He knows what he's talking about. Um, well, because like, Rabbi, I've heard you talk so many times about finances and, and um, you know, increasing your income on the podcast and things like yeah. that. But to hear you bring that extra dimension of it where you talk about there are some things that focusing on money alone as the sole object is a mistake, and there are things that matter beyond that, that's that's very nice to hear, and it's very true to what we t- try to tell authors as well. Look, if you're going to go into this just to make money, you may as well not bother because you're never going to be satisfied. You, you know, you're right. We, you know, we lived... Um, for a while in one of our favorite parts of the country, the Pacific Northwest. And um, there's a mountain about 70 miles south of Seattle called Mount Rainier. And climbing Mount Rainier, it's about 14,500 feet high. Um, climbing Mount Rainier is, is a tough challenge, but it's not like Everest. It's not undoable, and folks do it. But, but here's the, uh, the shocking thing. Um, if you simply go to the base of Mount Rainier, and uh, look at the top and then start right up, uh, the, the distance isn't that far. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you'd be walking no more than about three or four miles, but it turns out to be a 20-mile climb. Why? Because in mountain climbing, as in life, the direct straight-line approach is seldom correct. Mm. It seldom works. And I'm, I'm sure you explain that to your clients as well all the time. That um, there, there are a whole lot of things we need you to do before you can actually sit down and write. Yes. Or, or if we're going to, you know, these are the things we have to do first. Hey, I'm impatient. I want to get to the summit. No, that's not. You, you will get to the summit, but you won't get to the summit your way. You'll get to the summit our way because it is the only way. It's like. Uh oh. Oh, I'm not sure what happened. All right, there we are. Are we okay? Yep, yep, you're back. Um, um, I want to make money. Stop distracting me. I need to get to the office. I need to get to work. I need to to go to my investment club. Stop distracting me with things having to do with uh, uh, friendship. 
I haven't got time for friends now. I haven't got time for family. Stop telling me I need to get married now. No, you don't understand. You're not going to reach the summit your way. Yeah. Because if you are not married, there is going to be a dramatic reduction in your social connectivity. And since making money is utterly proportional to the number of people who know you, who like you, and who trust you, without a spouse, there are going to be many, many fewer of those people. Mm. So listen to me as I say, here is where you've got to focus, even though you'd rather just pick up your your backpack and steer for the summit, not going to work. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of uh, when I had some friends who were training to go climb Mount, R- Mount Rainier. And on one of our training hikes, uh, he was he was saying, you know, as we go up these steps, we want to do a couple of things. Number one, we want to go so slow that we don't start sweating. Because if we start sweating, it's done. Number two is there's a rest in each step. So don't walk quickly, walk methodically, and then stand up straight. And every time you stand up straight and lock your knee on a step, you get a little rest. And you might think that's not important until you've taken tens of thousands of steps, and then you're going to want every little rest in between. And if you don't take that, you might not come back. So you, we, we want to, there are certain things that we need to measure or certain things that we need to do slowly and methodically and with thought rather than what you're talking about, just going, just going for it, whether that's, it it sounds like, you know, getting, uh, getting some things out of, uh, out, out of order, perhaps like to that, to your point about that, uh, that woman, certain things are out of order and then certain things just won't come back in order at, at a, at at some point in time, I, I hope we're. And please tell me if if we're not, because we'd like to correct it. But are we adequately clarifying that we're not talking about you know make sure you've got balance in your life, spend enough time with this and spend. We're not doing that. We're we're going uh, to something far more crucial, and that is know how to deal with your social and maybe your political or your civic life in a way that also impacts positively your family and your fitness and your and your friendship, your family, uh, and in, know how to interact with your family yeah. in a way that enhances your uh, financial creativity as well. It, it's very much a case of, uh, of understanding, not that you have to allocate time proportionately and in a balanced way, but that what you do has to be done on each of these five things with an eye to the other four at all times. And that's what we're trying to provide. Yeah. They they affect each other. You just can't keep one and and say, well, this is in its own little box. And I can close that box for this year or two years or three years. It's because they all affect each other. You're going to be seeping out into each other. Yeah. That's my takeaway for sure. As a little story, uh, Rabbi, just to, I learned this from you. So I, I tried it and it worked. Um, I was speaking a couple of years ago with a uh, friend of mine. We were doing some business together. I was paying him to do some lead generation for me. And uh, he said, I noticed that you're very open and vocal about your faith. And, I, you know, it's just kind of different to me. I'm an atheist, he told me. Uh, but he wasn't a rude or obnoxious type of thing. It was just, you know, he was just sharing. And I said, and... Uh, he said, you know, the, the faith thing doesn't make sense to me. And I said, well, actually, if you think about it, it does. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, uh, I trusted you to generate leads for me. I paid you money because I had faith that you would help me generate leads. That's right. And then he said, gee, I never thought about that. And I said, you're married, aren't you? And he said, yes. I said, so when you asked your wife to marry you, you had faith she was going to stick around and you'd build a family together. Right. And he said, I I guess so. I said, well, there's no guarantee she was going to stick around. Is there? He said, no, I said, exactly. So all of these things are constantly interplaying. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, um, the example of the, of going up Mount Rainier, uh, I also think of Lincoln in the movie with Daniel day Lewis, where he says a compass will point you true North. 
but it's got nothing to say about the swamps and the chasms and the valleys that you're going to run into. Great, great, great line. Great line. <laughs> great line. Yeah. All of this has been so helpful, Rabbi and Susan, uh, for our authors, I'm sure, just as they think about putting their messages out there, getting them out there, marketing them. Uh, if you would like to pick up a copy of The Holistic You, we've got the website down there, rabbidaniellappin.com. And we are so grateful for your time, Rabbi and Susan. We know we've we've about run out of it here. So um, any last uh, any last comments uh, for the good of the audience? Well, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you guys. Um, um, I, I know we, we spoke a whole lot and you never interrupted us, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, but you ask great questions, and 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 we love that. And uh, and the time just sped by, and I didn't even realize uh, that we're at the at the end of our time available. But um, uh, yeah, look, the, um, the 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 secret I think that they were hoping to be able to uh, provide to people and allow people to dramatically enhance their lives um, is by this exposure to holistic thinking. And uh, and also, you know, the realization of of how much impact the spiritual or even the existence of a spiritual reality that is a new thing for many people as well. So um, we're excited about the book, and we're excited the kind of response it's been getting from early readers. Fantastic. Well, we so much appreciate your time and 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 everything you contributed to our audience today. Go to rabbidaniellappin.com if you want to learn more. And until next time, this is the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards. My co-host is Jason Todd, and we've been talking with Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin. See you next time. <laughs>